Welcome to The Mountain Gardener with your host, Ken Lane. Gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and local advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener. This is your host, Ken Lane. We're here every week talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona. In the Lane Lane Gardens, we are eating regularly from our vegetable gardens. The flower gardens look good. I mean, things look good. They're growing actively. We'll go over just what we're doing, how we're doing it, how to fertilize, what to look for, and, and a few problems uh, to, to kind of look after. But uh, lots of peppers coming off, so poblanos, big gyms, jalapenos. Those are our, our three that we personally like. Uh, a lot of folks will grow those habaneros and the really crazy hots. I think a habanero has got 5,000 Scoville units. That's how they rate it, how hot it is. Some of the hottest peppers have over a million Scoville units. It's what is that? Twenty times more? I mean, it's it's over twenty times as hot. It's so hot. There's no flavor. It's just heat. It burns your face off. There's like a hole in there in the back of your throat uh, when you get done eating them. I don't grow those. I like the flavor, and I like grilling them. And you know, what fresh off the off the the plant? I just eat. I'll eat a jalapeno just raw. It's that good. My mouth just watered. Uh, onions. Radishes came out this week. Uh, uh, beets. What else? Lettuce. There's lots going. Tomatillos are starting to form really strong. So it is that time. Watch a couple things. I did notice that I'm starting to see some tomato spotting, some disease. Uh, so and that's the rains. We've had rain pretty much every afternoon, at least where we're at. Uh, I know that the mountains of Arizona, it's, it's spotty at best. But over our house, we're up above the high school in the middle of Prescott here, rain very consistently every afternoon. Some parts haven't had any. I mean, it can be your neighbors right across the street didn't see any rain, but you did. Go for, that's the monsoon pattern for the mountains. That's how the rains come. But eventually, you're going to get some moisture. The humidity definitely has gone up, which makes things ripe for leaf disease and plant diseases and wilts and that kind of thing. So watch that, especially on your tomato plants. If you're growing tomatoes, where else? Uh, uh, petunias. I've seen that on petunias. Certain things. If you're seeing a leaf, it was nice and green. Now it's yellowing or browning at the tips. That is not good. If you're seeing speckles on the foliage, not good. These are all disease issues. They're not insects. There's a bacterial kind of thing feeding on the sugar within the structure of that plant or that flower or that fruit that's causing this spotting, wilting, or, 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 or having issues. And it will spread very quickly if you let it go. So for, for me, what I do is I'll go out probably a couple times a week when I'm picking the fruits or just I'm just admiring my gardens. I'll walk through with my, with my cup of coffee in the morning, off the dogs with me. We'll just pinch off some of the diseased or damaged leaves. Uh, any fruits that are like that more, but more so you'll see it with the leaves. I just pinch those off. With my tomatoes, I notice it's right at the base. So what happens is the rains come, it splashes on the soil. Those That, that, that disease is in the soil. When it splashes, it comes back up on the leaves, and so it spreads that way. So it's hard to get rid of. That's why you want to rotate your crops every year so you can prevent, help prevent. You can't prevent it, but you can, you can reduce some, or mitigate some of the issues. Right now what I'm doing is I'm just keeping my plants pruned up. I don't let any leaf. I'm looking to pick the bottom leaves off. I'm looking to take leaves off. And it's okay. You're not going to hurt your plants. They'll grow just as fast. It, it, it's okay. Uh, but I'm looking to pinch off anything that's diseased, spotted, or curled. Uh, Vertinellum wilt is a classic. Uh, there's no cure for this disease that gets in, in the plant, gets in the structure of the plant, and now the leaves start to curl up. And once that happens, because there's no cure, you pretty much rip the plant out of the ground and you kind of start over just to keep it from, from spreading to your other plants. I would suggest when you see a few curled leaves, just pick them off real quick. See if you can get ahead of this and don't just throw them down on the ground. Put them, have a trash can with you or a bucket or a garden tote 
and, and th throw them away. Get them off your property. You don't want that diseased leaf to be there just to come back and haunt you again in, in three weeks because you've had a couple heavy rains. So that, that's what I'm looking at. So most of my tomatoes, they don't have many leaves on the, on the bottom of them. They've all been picked up. I don't want any leaf growing down and touching the ground. I never let suckers or branches or anything grow towards the ground and touch it. I'm trying to stake things up or cage them up to keep them off the ground. The same would apply for tomatillo because uh, they're related, tomatoes, tomatillo, uh, peppers. Uh, pretty much any kind of uh, fruiting plant is going to be that way. I mean, not as much watermelons and that kind of stuff. I haven't seen that, but I am definitely noticing disease starting on my tomato plants. So I'm just, I'm just pruning them off, and it's okay. They're fruiting like crazy still. They'll just keep growing up. That's, that's okay, but just put it on your radar. What I do is when I do see anything with a leaf spot, if I don't find an insect, I'll share one insect I found in my gardens, what to look for, but uh, if I'm seeing just curling, spotting, browning leaves, what I'm doing is I'm cleaning them up. I'll fertilize them so that they push new foliage. That's really easy. Then I'll spritz the whole plant with Revitalize. It's an organic disease control. What it does, it is revitalize. It's, it's a foliar spray. You, you, you spritz it. It's kind of like a trigger sprayer. You kind of spritz the foliage. And then it keeps that disease from getting up, from spreading through that plant. And then it makes the structure of the plant actually more robust. And so if you're seeing it coming from the soil, you can actually, you can actually drench the soil. I've done that on a couple of plants, but mainly I'm spritzing my foliage right now. I'll do that every 10, 14 days or so, just to make sure uh, I'm not going to have anything take out my, my crops that I'm harvesting right now. I mean, we're, we've got, we're eating well. Uh, I am prevent, I'm doing a preventive strike on my pumpkins and zucchinis. So I always, I don't know what this is. It must be my backyard. I'm always getting powdery mildew. And they always get on to my squash kind of plants and pumpkins. So I'm just putting Revitalize on those, just going, I know it's coming. The rains are, it's been raining too much. I know it's just a matter of time. And I haven't seen powdery mildew on my plants yet. Uh, I know it's coming, but I'm hoping to, to, to re again, mitigate that or reduce the, the effect on it. As I see a leaf, it gets this powdery white coating on it. I'll thin that out. And just kind of a maintenance factor. It's called gardening. It's, this is not hard. I just go out with my coffee and I'll just kind of pinch things off. And as I see a little branch, I keep up with it. I don't have this you know, three-day process because I'm out there a couple times a week more talking to my plants, making nurture, nurturing them, bringing them back to life and not letting uh, nature come back and destroy them. So those are some things to watch in your own gardens. And if you're a flower gardener, say, I don't have tomatoes. I don't care, Ken. Why are you? Get to the next topic. Well, the, the same applies for your flowers, trees, uh, leaves. On, uh, I saw a little bit on my roses. So I was cleaning. I was opening up this, the, the roses has put a lot of growth on them. So I just took a few strategic branches or canes out of the middle so it would open it up. And then I just handpicked a few leaves off. I fertilized them with the all-purpose plant food, and they'll be back into bloom here probably by the end of the month. I mean, just full, glorious bloom. And so that that's so it, it applies across the board. These are just things. I mean, my name is Ken. We're just friends, and we're talking across the back fence. And we're just here's some things that I'm seeing in my own backyard gardens, and probably they'll the same thing will apply in your own gardens. Yeah, but I live in in Prescott Valley or or Williams or Flagstaff or Payson or it doesn't matter. Kingman, you're, we're all the same. We're all up in God's country. We're not that flatlander desert stuff. We're we're up here in the mountains where we get to enjoy a brighter sun and more wind and <laughs> dust. And, Pine trees and oaks and manzanitas and yuccas and agaves. Uh, that we're all in this thing together. Just it happens. These things happen at different times depending on your elevation. But ha what has more to do with it than, than elevation is whether you're a north, south, east, or west facing hill. So we're all on mountains typically or on elevation of some sort. So if you get a morning sun, it's pretty kind, easy to grow things. South south is pretty hot. North, you get things will be delayed. It's just cooler, darker over there. That's where I'm dealing with. I'm, I've got north slope gardens, so I see more disease and stuff on those. It takes longer for the snow to melt. 
It's just so I, I'll probably be two weeks beyond a neighbor right down the street that has a, a south-facing type of gardens. Lisa Waters Lane coming in the studio after this. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane, owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him every week for timely garden advice right for the gardens. Visit Ken where he can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Purple Magic Crepe Myrtle. You'll be wowed by the sheer amount and intensity of the purple blossoms that shadow this impressive bush. Leaves emerge as bold red foliage in spring and then turn bright green just as the purple flowers erupt in summer. It blooms twice, first in summer, then again in autumn. And at $39, you can have more than one in the gardens. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love to garden, they love to shop. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Timeless Beauty Desert Willow Tree. Large, fragrant burgundy and lavender flowers appear in big, bold clusters all summer long. This unique water selection is prized for its extra-long bloom time without the need of seed pods. The flowers are highly attractive to hummingbirds, 100% Arizona native and just $59. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love their native plants to really bloom, they love to shop. You've been listening to Ken Lane, the Mountain Gardener. Green thumbs learned while working in the Family Garden Center. Now welcome back to the Mountain Gardener. And we are back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes each week with your garden questions. Welcome back, Lisa. Thank you. Always good to be here. Have your gardens recovered? <laughs> <laughs> from our trip, from our vacation. You go away on vacation, part of the cost to travel mm-hmm. is we're going to lose some flowers. And we, we lost and we a lost couple of them. couple? Well, maybe. well, no, I mean, they all look pretty good, except for the more cactus, portulaca, <laughs> vincas, pentas, the bullet. You can't kill those things. They, yeah, they came through. It was, it was kind of hard took it. driving into the driveway and going, oh, my God. My pots. Yeah, well, that's the problem with irrigation. Sometimes they listen. Sometimes mm. your computer <laughs> doesn't listen to what you told it to do. So it's operator error. Well, no, it's computer. I'm going to blame it on the hardware, <laughs> and the hardware will blame it on the software. All you techie folks, you know what that's all about. So oh, sure. Anyway. Okay. Anyway, we got garden questions this yes. week. What do we got? Well, Gary would like to know about his mimosa. He has a beautiful mimosa that has always bloomed every year. This year, it's not blooming. Did he do something wrong? Does he need to add? Gotcha. What's yeah, up? You're, you're fine. It's just normally his mimosa will bloom end of June, July, somewhere in there. And so they're just a month late. The whole season has moved, uh, is late this year, from tomatoes to to mimosas or, or silk tassel tree to I mean, everything's just delayed. It was that spring was so chilled and May is usually when things start taking off, but May it snowed and hailed and <laughs> was cold. And it just, the season is the season, but it slides back and forth by two, three weeks. And this year it just slid. I predict if you fertilize that with all purpose plant food, just chuck some of that down, pray for an afternoon rain mm-hmm. within Two weeks, that mimosa will be in full bloom. If you've really took a look at it, I'll bet it's got buds at the top of it starting. Maybe not cracking color, but but you can see the flower buds. I'll bet it's that. It's just delayed. Yeah, so. like everything else this season. Yeah. If it truly isn't going to bloom, then that's a nutrient thing. We can, mm-hmm. we can load it up with superphosphate or something. We can force it to bloom, and there's plenty of time to get it to bloom for them. Mm-hmm. So if you take a close look, and if it doesn't work, come in and talk to us, Gary, and we'll help you make sure, ensure that it blooms for you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, our next question is from Rita. She wants to know, what's the difference between a mole and and a gopher, <laughs> and do we have moles here or just gophers? Good, good, good. That's an East Coast person, so they're coming from that's Midwest East Coast has moles, so they get a little bit bigger than pocket gophers, uh, and they do not live in the Southwest. So we have groundhogs; they're more up towards Williams, Flagstaff, they're a little bit higher altitude. And then we have pocket gophers, probably six thousand foot, seven thousand and below. And so pocket gophers, they call it a pocket gopher because it has a little pocket under its chin where it scoops up dirt and it uses it kind of like a shovel or a bag or something. It just throws it in a chin and then it shoves it out this hole. 
And so you'll see these little mounds around uh, the gardens. Uh, they do eat your garden roots. So they'll eat trees. I've seen trees fall over because all the roots were gone. I've seen broccoli just disappear below the <laughs> ground. I've seen all the calamity you would think with a underground. It's an underground rat. Mm-hmm. And gophers, you know, all rats deserve to die. That's just it. That's, a, that's from a southern boy. So it just we know they're just bad. They carry disease and problems. Actually, gophers don't carry that much disease, but, no, but you just don't want them in your plants. Your yeah. <laughs> Get rid of them. We'll show you. Come talk to us. I am the gopher master. You are. I can get rid of gopher. Oh, any, anywhere. No, I don't go there. But when we lived in Skull Valley, you you had like this routine for killing right. gophers. Yeah. That's what it takes. <laughs> to go all it was marine crazy. On them. But they can be, if you've ever fallen in a gopher hole. Yeah. Yeah. Not good. If you've got so. ranch, I mean, horses can break mm-hmm. a leg. I mean, dogs can get stuck. I mean, just not stuck, but caught. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's something you really want to watch. Yeah. And mainly, they'll eat your landscape till nothing's left. It just mm-hmm. looks like a bomb, like someone took a bomb field and just took out everything. Yeah. And so they're, pro- and they'll multiply two to three litters per year. So they go from one to many in just, just like a year. I mean, just they, you have to get on yeah. them. And so you set a trap or you do bait. Uh, we've got a fancy little tool here that we, we suggest you use, or there's gas. Mm-hmm. There's different ways to attack it, depending on where you're at, what kind of soil you have. We can help guide you through. Right. Don't let them get a foothold in the garden. No. Because they'll take over. Thomas would like to know, can he use honeysuckle as a ground cover for erosion control, or is there something better you can recommend? Oh, honeysuckle, does that's a great one. Now, you'll see them staked up where they're mainly, they'll crawl up a fence. That's where you see them in magazines or they're magical. But they will grow equally as well, if not better, trailing across the ground or up a hill or to, to, halt, to hold things in. And the beauty with vines, they'll root and you put your drip emitter on that plant and the, the, the vines will grow out, oh, I don't know, six, eight, ten feet. And then they'll touch the ground. And start rooting and form another another plant. So it'll quickly spread for you. But other suggestions. And here's where you can probably help me just as well. <laughs> Cotoneaster, spreading junipers. junipers. I've seen over at Yavapai College, they use trumpet vine mm-hmm. as a ground cover. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. It's beautiful. A Virginia creeper. Yeah. Another vine as a ground cover. It's amazing. Uh, but we've got a whole series of ground covers here if you need help. If it's a really big space, I would suggest changing it up. This is where having a designer help you put companion plants together that complement each other mm-hmm. than how to line them out. So if you go with an entire hillside and nothing but honeysuckle, it can look kind of too much of the same. So sometimes you yeah. inject you know blocks of things mm-hmm. depending on the size of that hill. Just totally take a camera phone, take a picture, bring it in. Quick measurement, you know, it's 100 feet or it's 10 feet. That's totally different. It makes a difference. We can help you design that really well. Right. Make it look. Now, look. you've told me, and I can never remember, do vines, if you have a hill, you can plant the vines at the bottom of the hill or the top of the hill? Or does it matter? It doesn't matter. Both. Okay. Vines on. naturally want to grow, or plants naturally want to grow up to the sunlight. So if you plant at the top of the hill, you're going to have to train it to go down. It's some, some hills you can't plant in the hill. It's just mm-hmm. too steep. So you plant at the top, then you start pinning. We've got fancy pins here. You just, you just kind of stake it right there and pin it to the ground. You force it. You train it mm-hmm. to grow where you want it to grow. But it'll naturally just grow up. Okay. All right. Lawrence would like to know, can he grow a semi-dwarf cherry in a container? And if so, what size container and how long can it be grown in that container? <laughs> okay. So there's a lot of variables there. You can give me three and there's probably more than that. Yes, you can grow trees in containers. We do it ourselves. We've got Japanese maples and peaches. We've had cherries. I always say go with the semi-dwarf to true genetic dwarf, but genetic dwarf they look funny. They're, they're, they look like Dr. <laughs> Seuss. Like they're tiny, tiny. So a standard-sized tree, if you want a vase-shaped plant, let's say right. to, beside a patio or a deck, mm-hmm. go with a semi-dwarf variety of fruit, and cherries are fine. minimum size pot, I would say minimum for a tree would be 20 to 24 inch, probably 24 inch. Mm-hmm. It's all about soil quantity. The deeper, the larger, the wider. The more soil, the longer it can last. We're talking... Probably 
I mean, years. You can get years out of a tree in a, in a container. You'll know when it's root bound when you water it, and the water will no longer penetrate the root <laughs> ball. It's just solid roots all the way through. But that'll be years and years down the road. Mm-hmm. And and I would say also another thing with our peach tree. So we had a cherry tree, and we finally just got tired of it and said, oh, we want a peach. So we swapped out the container, uh, went with peaches, and summer pruning is so important for containered trees. So we just got done trimming back all the suckers, all the spring growth. Uh, we trimmed it back and shaped it so it didn't get too out of proportion to that pot. Mm-hmm. Do the same thing for our Japanese maples. Just trim it back. I mean, it'll grow above the eaves. I'm going, okay, that looks funny. It, no, no, you're, 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 not gonna, you're not in control. The gardener is back in your space. So you just trim it back, and it keeps its shapeliness. You fertilize it. And it just looks tr- just tremendous. People come over and see a peach tree or a cherry tree and full fruit on your back patio. They kind of go, wow, can I have one of those? Grandkids, it's like yeah. irresistible. Their, <laughs> their face is going to be purple with cherry juice before they get done. Mm-hmm. So absolutely, you can do that. Also, use water's potting soil. That soil mix is made for here. And trees just root out and fill in and just do so well in that. It's a specially made potting soil for here. But the peat moss in that soil really makes plants grow well. Ken Elisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners, be right back. You're listening to Ken Lane, a.k.a. the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week in Prescott at Waters Garden Center. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain gardens. I hate weeds. Monsoon rains are so refreshing, even my landscape comes alive. But so do my weeds. Stop weeds in their track in one simple step. Water's weed and grass stopper spreads like fertilizer. It kills weed seed before monsoon rains allow them to sprout. No need to weed. It's safe for trees, even flower beds, and so much safer than that toxic waste the big box sells. Weed and grass stopper. It's just $24 and only found at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Hi, Ken, with our Vine of the Week and our Arizona Sunset Trumpet Vine. Huge, deep red flowers cluster to create a dramatic summer show. This vigorous vine thrives and blooms with near neglect. Fast growing to cover chain link fence, shade structures, and trellis quick. Easy to train as a ground cover up a rock face to hold soils from erosion in just $34. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love vines that bloom red, they love to shop. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Join the conversation every week as he answers timely garden questions. Email Ken a question directly from your phone to his desktop through the web at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Now welcome back your host, Ken Lane. We love having people over to our house. We love having guests and friends and and family over uh that's just we set up our house with big entertainment patios and hot tubs and grills and fire pits and it's just beautiful we're overlooking the dells it's just it's beautiful it's pleasant to sit out there in the morning and sip coffee or in the evening sip tea it's just it's just so pleasant we love having friends over so this week we're going to have our all of our staff our staff and their family uh we generally don't have outsiders and I have never had a garden club come through my gardens. I've never had I've been on a tour. This is my private space. I, I don't have many areas that are just mine. Even the front yard, people drive by going, hey kid, and you just start chit chatting. Uh, in the backyard though, this is our sanctuary. It's our private garden. And it truly is a delight. The dogs love hanging out back there and we we share that with our our friends and family, and now our employees, our staff members and their families. We'll show them off. We'll show off, tell them why we're rain harvesting this way and why the pond flows here and what we can expect from how we uplight the junipers and the artwork and we'll, why we're using uh, this kind of ground cover instead of this. We share our gardening thinking, our philosophy, and why it looks so good. The pressure's on, though. I mean, you have a whole bunch of gardeners. I mean, these are hardcore plant nerds. They work at a garden center, one of the best in the country, and they're coming over to your house. The pressure's on, I'm telling you. So I, I want to make sure it looks looks really good. So they'll be wowed. 
And so they'll have some opinions or thought or questions. We'll just, and then we'll have some barbecue and I'm going to roast my uh, father's special stuffed pepper recipe. So he handed down to me. So we're going to harvest the, the gardens and roast peppers on the grill. I'm going to have my grandmother's peach iced tea out. And so it's just going to be a delightful time in the backyard. Uh, that's part of the reason that we're such a great place to work. I mean, we're noted as, I mean, Lisa and I are noted as the great bosses because we actually care about our people. We, we, we share everything. I mean, there's an open book. You want to know how much we made, how much we sold, how many units of this, what it costs to do this, why we have a great employee discount. We just treat our staff with respect. We treat them like family. They truly are like family. Uh, so if, if you're doing something wrong, we'll call you on it. Just up front, hey. And if you're doing something great, we'll, go, we'll call you on it. Go, hey, well done. Love that. Keep it up. Hey, can you help me with this? I need, I need your opinion on this. How do we figure this out? Help us with this. And so I'm, I'm actually looking forward to Thursday having the staff over to the house. It sh- should be fun. So I have a couple of things. We, we went on vacation, was that two weeks ago, and I had a couple of deaths. So I'm going to have to freshen up the pots a little bit. But other than that, Things look good. My petunias are yellowing just a touch. They're blooming like crazy. I need to refertilize. They've the foliage is getting yellow in spots. So I need to kind of make sure they're green before. Uh, and I think I can do that. Here's a secret too. If you see some yellow foliage, if you want to green it up really fast, do not use ironite. That's the old school way of doing it. But it is probably an iron deficiency. And and here's why I say that. Iron deficiency is is the plants have been flushed, they've been watered so much, uh, the nutrients get locked up in the soil or it flushed out all the nutrients and it's lacking really lots of minerals. And the main mineral is iron. And so iron is yellowing to the foliage. It's very easy to give it some iron and you'll see iron at any garden center, any box store, any warehouse, uh, hardware store, they're all going to have iron out. It's going to be in capped because this is the time of year when you sell it. Here's what you want to look for. You want the bag to say quick release or chelated, C-H-E-L-A-T-E, chelated. Chelated iron means available right now. I mean, the plant, it's usually liquid form, not always. Sometimes it's in a granular form. We've got both here at the garden center. Uh, We've got actually three different quick release irons. We don't sell a slow release iron, which is what ironite is. It just, you're, you're putting iron on, ironite on now for, next year's use, really. Uh, Here you want something faster. You need to react now. And so you'll put a chelated iron on or a liquid iron, and you'll see that plant literally green up within days. I mean, it is amazing to watch. Kind of fun. And it just takes it right up, takes it through the root structure and just right into the structure of the plant and greens it right up. Keep on it. I did notice one, two of my plants. I have a pansy that, that survived the summer. It was looking good. All of a sudden, it went yellow on me. Let me tell you why. And then my tomatillo uh, vegetable started to yellow. It was not an iron deficiency. I got to looking at this, and it was spider mites. Spider mites, there was a little bit of webbing on the pansy, but none on the tomatillo. I didn't see it, but they had both of the same insect. But there's a spider web. It's called spider. It's called spider mite. Had... Uh, it's got a spider web to it, but little tiny thousands of insects get on the plant and they scrape the foliage, the, the flesh off of the leaves. And so they started to get this thinned yellowing look. So the, the symptom was yellowing, going, what the heck went on? A week ago, they looked great. Now they don't. I sprayed them with some triple action, which is a spider. It's a mite control. And they're looking better already. It'll probably take them a couple weeks to recover, but they're starting to, to rebound. Uh, But that's that's a couple things to look at in your own gardens. The Mountain Gardener, your source for timely garden advice right for higher elevations. Guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. High waters with this week's Plant of the Week and our Black Satin Blackberries. A thornless, milky smooth blackberry that loves the Arizona sun and produces the most deliciously sweet, deep blackberries. Soft pink flowers cover the nimble canes and then yield hordes of the most delicious, juicy blackberries a gardener could hope for. Ready to plant in just $19 and only found at Waters Garden Center. 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love to grow the sweetest berries love to shop. 
Hi, Waters with the Plants of the Week and our Black Lace Elderberry. Tense purple foliage is finely cut for a dramatic effect. Creamy pink flowers contrast nicely with the purple leaves. The red berries are edible and make delicious elderberry wine, jams, or just left on the bush to attract birds. A dramatic accent are planted as a trouble-free head-high hedge and just $17. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love their elderberries, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert, Ken Lane. Mountain gardening is very rewarding, with a few of Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts sure to turn your thumbs even greener. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And we are back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio for you. She comes and just shares her garden expertise, her garden thoughts, what's going on in her gardens. And just shares that so you get a different perspective. If you talk to 10 different gardeners, you're bound to get at least 12 different ideas. So just on any given subject, because it's exciting Mm -hmm. uh, to to see how gardens come together. No one way to garden is right. It's whatever's right for you. And so... No, my way is right. No, my (laughs) way is right. That's why you make such a good team. You are an independent gal. That's what I love about you. I was raised to be an independent woman. And you are. Yeah. And so are our girls. <laughs> Three daughters. And actually, all four kids are oh, yeah. very independent. I mean, surprise, it, like it stuns some people where they're going, wow, they can go off across the country, across the world on their own. Going, yeah, I've been doing that since they were like 12. So yeah, we're, we're flying our kids back to visit grandparents when they were mm-hmm. 10, 8 on airplanes by themselves. This is pre 9 11. We're dating ourselves a little bit. But, <laughs> That's true. But yeah, absolutely. They did. We used to send them to uh, Haiti. Where else have they been? Thailand. Yeah, they've been. They've been more places. Than, they have. That's than irritating. You or I. Yes, <laughs> it is irritating. Of course, they've also been nasty, nasty places. So oh, they've, they've been, been to, nice places too, all yeah. over Europe. And our yeah. oldest, well, one of the twins just got back from Greenland. I mean, it's yeah. yeah. So garden ideas. Okay. You're sharing that. Well, enough about our kids. Well, what? actually, it ties in. Really? I'm going to tie okay. these two topics together. Okay. So travel. We love to travel. Yeah. In fact, we just got back. And as you mentioned before, when we got back, we looked at our pots, or I looked at our pots and started crying because uh, the irrigation system didn't go off. And so we lost a few things. But there are some things that looked even better yes, <laughs> than when they we were, left. They, yeah. So uh, I thought I would talk about those things that if you're a traveler, if you're a lazy gardener, if you forget to water sometimes, these are plants that they're okay with that. Drive on neglect. Yes. And broken irrigation (laughs) and forgetfulness and just, yep, that's great. Just keep going. So I thought I'd start with annuals first. I thought you'd start with cactus. Yeah, well. <laughs> Succulents. So yep. annuals, those things that have one season and then they're gone once we get cold. Yep. So the things that survived in our yard that looked beautiful when we got back was the annual vinca, mm-hmm. uh, which is just a great plant. It deadheads itself. It's crazy drought hardy, pretty green leaves, bright color flowers. I love that plant. Uh, so definitely vinca does very, very well. Portulaca. Uh, which there again, dark leaves, but the the flowers on those are almost like fluorescent. Hot, yeah. yeah. They just scream at you. Have you very, noticed? Very pretty. Hours in that front out by uh-huh. the driveway, they close up. The flowers close every night. Yes. and they open up during the day. I, I did know. not know that about Portulaca oh, until yeah. Yeah, it interesting. It's really kind of cool. We actually have two. We have one that's like a pink, pink, and then we have one that's yellow, and they they both do that. So those did very well. Anything in the succulent family. Uh, so we had some uh, dragon's blood and uh, Angelina. Both did wonderfully. Just kept on going. I don't think we hardly ever water those guys. No, we don't. I mean, we over we overwatered the first batch and they died. <laughs> Replaced them. We neglected them. And they thrive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the, the one that surprised me actually was the Mandevilla vine. Um, I expected to find it toast, but I think those thick kind of waxy leaves kept the moisture in yeah. and it, they were both looking good when we got back. They, they thrive down in Phoenix. Mm-hmm. If they go down there in 110, 15 degrees, they'll thrive up here in our, you know, 
warm, 95 <laughs> degrees. It's like nothing to a Mandevilla. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So those were some of the annuals that did really well. And then we had some perennials that did nicely as well. The the coneflower, the echinacea, um, it, I don't think... I don't think we even have that on irrigation, do we? No, we don't. No, but it just came up by itself. (laughs) And I've been nurturing it ever since. It's a wildflower. Truly a wildflower. It's just tough as nails. And I love the new colors they're coming out with. There's um, sombrero hot coral, which is a real pretty orangey pink one. Uh, There's a uh, powwow wild berry, bright red. There's a tomato soup. Let me guess, red? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, they're kind of coming out with double flower ones. So instead of having like, instead of like a daisy type flower, it's more of a double flower. Very, very pretty. There's a pink one out there that's absolutely gorgeous. Flower maybe 18 inches tall. Fla- the, the the plant is 18 inches tall. The mm-hmm. flower is maybe four inches, five inches across. Right. A cone shape, thus cone mm-hmm. flower is its common name. But, <laughs> but yeah, Echinacea is its botanical or Latin name. Right. Yeah. And a great butterfly attractor. Mm-hmm. So good for bringing pollinators into the yard. Black-eyed Susan or Rebecca is another wildflower type plant that, boy, is it tough. <laughs> you never have just one. You're going to have, have multiples because they'll, they'll reseed and come mm-hmm. up other places. Which well, is uh, great. Mexican primrose, that's mm-hmm. spread out uh, throughout the backyard Yeah, the same way. Kind of very and there's similar. a little daisy out there that we have. Yeah, is it an aster? Or I didn't daisy? plant it. It just kind of showed itself. up. And, and if you're pretty... I encourage you to grow and show off in the yard. And if you're ugly, be careful. You're, you're about to be gone. Yeah. Daylilies. Um, I think daylilies had their time in the sun where they were like daylily clubs and blah, blah, yeah. blah. And then they kind of went out of favor. But daylilies are a great little plant for the yard. And there again, they've come up with more than just the yellow daylily. Yeah. You know, yeah, Stella de Oro. Yeah. So they've got the purple de Oro which does the same thing, repeat bloomer, which we mm-hmm. want in a day lily. Uh, they have a ruby Stella, which is kind of a oh, real neat. dark uh, oh, fuchsia. I think it's supposed to be red, but I think it's fuchsia. Uh, Endlessly Coral is another one that we've gotten this year that's new. Really, really pretty out there in the yard. And those guys are tough, and they're mostly animal resistant, I believe. Aren't All they? day lilies are, are mm-hmm. animals. Yeah, javelina. Deer, they're, they're not going to bother daylilies. Yeah, right. there's proof. I mean, just they're right there, and they can eat them, and they don't. So. Uh, another one, of course, we can't forget the Russian sage. Those those will survive a nuclear holocaust, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> but they just, you can ignore them, especially if they've been in a year or so. Just ignore yeah, don't them. Don't water them. And they're Or happy. they'll get, yeah, they'll actually bloom better if you don't water them. Mm-hmm. Fertilize them, bring the color out, but right. don't water them. They'll just take whatever rain comes and they will do really well. Yeah. Gara is that way too, I yeah. have found. Uh, we have a couple patches of Gara that I know there's no irrigation to them and hasn't been for a couple of years. And I keep thinking, oh, they're not going to come back. Yeah. <laughs> but they do. And yeah. they have the white ones. They come in pink. They come in a dark pink. Some are tall. Some are a little shorter. Uh, but a great addition out there into the yard. And then also, we kind of mentioned sedums. But um, we have one out there in a pot that has a mixture of, I think, three different succulents. Yeah. In it, just three different yeah. sedums. It is really cool. In fact, we just took it and just plopped it right into a container got rid of the plastic pot and yep. popped it into a nice ceramic. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And those will actually winter over nicely for you. And you'll have that color even in the wintertime, the dragon's blood. And the Angelina is like a lime green, kind of drapes over, really, really pretty. And I just love the fact that they keep that color almost year-round. Yeah, and a bright, pretty fluorescent flower, mainly in mm-hmm. spring. So it's an evergreen perennial. This is important for us, your Southern Cal, Phoenix, t- Tucson folks. The, there's a lot of annuals, the, uh, sedums, so mm-hmm. they, they won't go through oh, the winter. Yeah. These are varieties that will winter over for us. They're the hardiest of all the sedums uh, uh, or succulents. Uh, they don't have thorns, mm-hmm. but they just spread. And they've got this real chubby, leafy. They retain a lot of moisture within their, their foliage, mm-hmm. and so that's what makes them so tough. Yeah. Santalina, uh, the last one I mentioned would be the Santalina. I like it because it has a really pretty gray tone to it. So it, it's nice contrast out in the yard. And there again, you could That's called it. lavender cotton, right? Cotton, Santalina. La- lavender cotton. Yeah. 
Yeah. One of those. You got two names. It so does. We've got them, and all these you can find at the garden centers oh, yeah. right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could plant them right now, and they'll sure. thrive in the summer sun. And these are things that you can't if you if you think you've got brown thumbs, just make the list, replay the podcast, come, come talk to us. We'll we'll show you the list, and you cannot kill these <laughs> unless you care for them. Too, too much, much. <laughs> overwater them or something. Those are great suggestions. Whether you vacation, travel, or just want things that are tough because you want to work less and have more beauty with less work, there's the list for you. Lisa yeah. Waters Lane in the studio. Be right back with Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. Look for more tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts through Ken's website. Podcast the show, read his weekly garden column, or follow him on Facebook and Instagram at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. High waters with the plants of the week and our local chase tree. Fragrant lilac blooms cover this tree that can also be pruned into a tall bush and blooms all summer long. No special skills needed for this bloomer. Easy to grow, heat-loving, low water user, and disease-free. These are really nice bushes for $39. We also have very tall trees in bloom for an impressive $120. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love local blooming trees, they love to shop. Hi, Lisa here with the Plants of the Week and our little Janie Gara. Little Janie is a charmer with flowers that float above this 15-inch plant. The fluorescent pink flowers will wow the hummingbirds with Janie's charm as well. Hummingbirds throughout the neighborhood will visit your plants. They're just so popular and only $14. She thrives in hot, dry gardens and only found at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love their native plants to be beautiful and hassle-free, they love to shop. Welcome to the Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane. Gardening in the mountains is different. Listen to Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts guaranteed to make your gardens more beautiful than ever this year. Now for better advice that works locally, welcome your host, Ken Lane. One of the plants that is really shining, and it always happens every summer through fall, there's a certain type of plant that outshines all others. Now, Right now, the crepe myrtles are in bloom. They're midsummer type rock stars, a rose of Sharon. They are unbelievable this year. How many flowers, the hibiscus shaped flowers, are on these, these plants? But from this point forward, you'll find that your decorative grasses or ornamental grasses, not turf, we're not talking mowing, we're not any of that. It's, you use these like a shrub, and then you, treat, you put them on the same drip system as your trees. And you, you kind of abuse them. You, th- you don't hardly think about them. And then they just start growing up. These soft fronds coming up start to plume. Uh, they're just easy, easy to grow. They're, f- they're typically very deep-rooted and very fibrous root structure, very much like a palm tree, which makes them very robust. So the mountains of Arizona are famous for our decorative grasses. And probably the number one grass you'll find at, at any elevation – Anywhere in the state, uh, we've got, I mean, Prescott Valley, you all are famous, all the way up to Paulden and Skull Valley, all the way, can keep going. Uh, Kingman, famous, Payson, famous for their bear grass, B-E-A-R, bear. It's an evergreen grass. At first, you'd, you'd think that it was possibly a yucca, but the flower is very unique. It's got a big white a cluster of flowers that hovers above it. Not really a plume. It's actually got flowers on it. Very pretty. It's one of the only evergreen types of of grasses, and it grows wild. It's just it's a native of Arizona. Plant it once, and you're done. In fact, I would say that one. Plant it, and don't even put it on your drip system. Water it by hand. It's it's that tough. Get it rooted, uh, and then once it's all established, forget about it. It'll just go by itself. Another one that's very similar to that is deer grass, like deer, like 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 animals out in the yard, deer. Um, that's There's another one, or muley grass, or neambergia. There's several names for that, but there's several varieties. There's pink varieties and white varieties. This is a short grass, maybe not even three feet, two feet tall, with, with very light, airy, 
type of, of plumes to it, truly a plume, not a flower, and the light shines through those the, the foliage and just it's very pretty. Wind blows, just gently has this grass float back and forth. It just adds so much, especially if you're on a, on a windier hillside. This is where grass is. Why they do so well, they'll take the wind, they've got a deep root structure, and they give and take with that gusting of winds. So if you're in a rock pile, the, the, the roots tend to find their way down in between the rocks, and they just adapt really well. So I've got all of those. In, in our backyard, we, we plant grasses in, in containers or in the backyard or in raised beds. We, we plant grasses because they look so good. Another one that we really do well with, uh, probably one of our favorites we have the most of, are coral forester grass. Now, this is a... Uh, it's not, I wouldn't call it native. I wouldn't call it low care, but it's stunning. I mean, it is low water once a week like you would a tree, and it's fine. And, but the plumes on this thing, it starts early, like April, and then it keeps blooming through the end of the year. It's amazing how good this thing looks for how long. Uh, very dark, rich, green foliage. The reason that we have so many coral forester grasses, it only gets three three feet tall maybe. Straight up and down. Doesn't get mangy, doesn't fall over, just straight up and down. Uh, we like them because they're pretty. We usually will plant them in triangular, you know, odd number shapes. So triangular, three in a, three in a cluster. Uh, but the dogs, we've got dogs. We love our dogs. you got to take care of your dogs, right? If you have cats, I'm sure the same way. The cats would love to digest this rich green. It's almost like having a wheatgrass smoothie every morning. It's very healthy for you. Well, dogs know this about coral forester grass. Now, if you've got a bunch of deer and javelina roaming through your yard, I don't know if I'd put that one right out there. But if it's in the backyard where it's protected, where ours is, um, go at it. Just pretty. Dogs like it. Birds use it for nesting. It's just a great ornamental grass. It, and it's a perennial. It comes back every year you can count on this, and it gets even bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, Mexican feather grass. Be a little weedy, kind of invasive, but very tough. So very lacy, short, kind of just above ankle high, maybe between ankle and knee high, somewhere there, foot 18 inches tall. A tough little grass. The grasses do really, really well. Of course, the most famous of all grasses, the one that your grandparents grew and your great-grandparents grew, that would be pampas grass. I do not grow that one myself. The thing is a beast. I mean, children, dogs have been lost in pampas grass. These things are, I mean, 10 feet tall by 12 feet wide. Big, huge, arching uh, blades coming out. But they do have that ginormous white plume. White or red or pink uh, is kind of what they come in. Now, the white one, there is a new variety that's been dwarfed. We figured out how to dwarf an actual pampas grass so it doesn't get as big. Uh, they can get so large, they almost make your house look puny. And you don't want plants that do that. You, your plants should accentuate the beauty of your house, the architecture, the flow, the feng shui, the, the entertainment, the privacy. There's a lot to it. There's a design element uh, to, to your landscape that enhances your backyard or front yard appearance, how you enjoy your house. Um, pampas grass for many of your smaller lots is just too big. It gets so large. I mean, a 12 foot grass in your front yard is way above the eaves. And so it can be too, too big there. That's where it's better to go with, um, Japanese striped grass, zebra grass. I've got both of those are beautiful. It's, it's like, a it's like a really dwarfed pampas grass, much shorter, probably only three feet tall instead of 12. So it's, it's a third the size, a quarter the size, but the blades are, are thick and green, and then they have a stripe either up and down, Japanese striped grass, or across, like zebra grass. They're very pretty. The plumes aren't quite as, I plant those for the foliage, the actual blades of grass are very interesting. I mean, you look at it and go, what the heck is that? That's cool. Oh, man. And then when it plumes, it's kind of a bonus, but it's not as pretty as the coral forester grass actually it has a prettier bloom to it uh, than the others. but And then you get into the really dwarfed stuff, the tiny things, your blue fescues. That's a great uh, uh, grama grass. It's a native, just grows wild, does really well, only gets oh inches tall. Uh, we've got that actually in seed, which you could seed that right now, I would think, or in actual plugs or starts. 
generally right now, this is a good time to head to your garden center and take a look because most of the grasses are, they're up. They're in, they're, you, they're looking their best. This is when they become rock stars. In the spring, they don't look as good. They're just starting to emerge. They've got a little bit of growth to them, but they aren't as pretty as Gallardia and Full Bloom. Oh my God, lilacs, the fragrance. Oh my God, those, those sell. We can't keep them in stock. The grasses, more the designers, landscapers, folks that have know what they can do, they'll plug them in. Right now, we'll sell more of the grasses because they look so good and less of the lilacs, less of the, the other stuff, the spring bloomers, because they're done. They're just green shrubs in a bucket. But a, 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 a bare grass with its rigid stalk, I mean, stalks and it's going into bloom, that, that's just pretty. One to, one to kind of go with that, how often is this is my designer hat, how often plug in yuccas, agaves and desert spoons i'll use them like a grass they don't their 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 spines are a little more rigid they they can poke you sometimes depending on the variety that you're using but their shape and their structure is the same from a design standpoint you use them the same way in, in a landscape quite often by the mailbox by the patios where the grandkids romp around you don't want an, uh, you know, a perii agave that's got spines on it four inches long that'll impale your dog. It's maybe out there a little further away. It'd be better to have a bear grass or, or a soft leaf yucca or something close, something that's cuddlier, uh, closer where you're entertaining. So you're not always living in fear. Never plant a, a prickly pear right next to the patio or deck or in a, potty, in a pot as you're coming up to the front door. It's going to get you. I'm telling you. It's just waiting. Okay, got more in store for you. Be right back with uh, Ken Lane and the Mountain Gardener. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center, located in Prescott, 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to the Mountain Gardener. Hi, Lisa with the Plants of the Week and our Tiger Eye Sumac. You can't kill this native plant, and it's so fancy. Chartreuse foliage quickly develops into lacy yellow leaves, which contrast nicely with the posy pink stems. All this turns the color of orange peels through autumn. A dramatic focal point when planted as an accent at the edge of ponds and dry creek beds, all for just $39. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love fancy native plants love to shop. High Waters with the Plants of the Week and our Dark Beard Spirea. If you want butterflies, fragrant flowers, low water plants that take little maintenance, then look at this dark blue wonder. The dark bearded flowers only grow to knee high and the perfect replacement for aggressive Russian sage, but equally as pretty. A big bold plant is just $49. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love to garden, they love to shop. You've tuned in to The Mountain Gardener with local garden expert, Ken Lane. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions that are sure to make a difference in your gardens. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. Now the last segment, I I was talking about decorative grasses or ornamental grasses. These are all perennials. They come back every year. Usually in the winter, you, you keep them upright. They'll kind of brown out for you and by... February, they'll start to lay over because snows have taken them down. You, you take some head shears or something, you shear them down close to you know ankle height, fertilize them in March, and they start coming back and doing their thing. They're, they're literally that easy. Uh, very, very easy to grow. Low care. If your pampas grass, if your coral forester grass, your zebra grass, little bunny, whatever kind of grass you have, If you're noticing that your friends, your neighbors, uh, you remember last year they were prettier, but they just didn't perform as well lately, Uh, that's almost always a nutrient thing. Now, these are very fast-growing plants. They're very large. Uh, They're putting out a lot of of growth for a small plant, so lots of, of blades of grass coming out. They tend to be heavy feeders, heavier than, let's say, a cactus or a desert willow or some of these things. They're just kind of easy. If it's not pluming the way that you want, more than likely it's going to come down to a food issue. And there's still plenty of time to bump up the nutrients and have your plants really perform. 
this is for anything, but, but especially grasses. I hear this quite often as we get into, let's see, October, and everyone's pampas grass looks like glorious, and then yours looks wispy and thin, and the, the plumes are kind of laying over. They get bent in the wind. They're just weak. They're emaciated. You can tell that's always a food issue. I mean, almost. It could be gophers or something weird. Your neighbor ran over it with a truck. But more than likely, it's going to be a food issue. Simply give it some all-purpose plant food, that 744 food. It's got phosphorus in it, but mainly the cottonseed meal. In that food, cottonseed meal brings out the color, and it brings out the, the, the flower piece of that plant. And so it needs quite a bit of that. I'd put that on around the drip line, which grass is kind of weird. Where is the drip line on a grass? Trees are easy. The trunk, from the trunk to the outer branch, that's considered the drip line or when the rain comes. And where is it going to drip on underneath the root structure? That's where you want to focus your food. Well, grasses, you don't really throw it in the middle of the grass. That's obviously the drip line. But you kind of put it around the edges of the grass. This is really important for agaves, yuccas, things that uh, bear grass that have kind of structures that bring all the food and all the water to the heart of the plant. Well, there you want to be a little careful and strategically with your hand to kind of sprinkle it around the outer edge of that plant and you get better uptake and you're less likely to burn the heart of the plant. It's kind of, it's kind of school of hard knocks. I'm telling you, my name's Ken. We're just friends, and I have blundered in a big way this way. This, I don't want you to make that kind of mistake. So I think now I started out the program with bugs. I think next week I'll go deep into insects and bugs, what to look for. Uh, so, so we're starting to be really active. If you happen to have something funky going on, bring it into the garden center. We've got this high-powered microscope. We'll show you what's going on with your plant. And then we've got garden classes every Saturday. So this weekend it was the secret garden, privacy screens. Next week we go into bugs, the good bugs, butterflies, bees, and hummingbirds, how to draw more of those in. Herbal gardens, we've got a pro coming to sharing herbs and how to use them. Edible landscapes uh, with trees and berries are August 31st. So every Saturday at 930, it's a free garden class. Take a look at that. It's at watersgardencenter.com. There, there, you'll see a classes button right there at the front page or Facebook under uh, Waters Garden Center events. You Facebook folks, you know what to do with. Twitter, there's less of you out there. I mean, we'll tweet, tweet, tweet them through our tweet page. I don't know. Instagram's not made for information out like that. Or just stop by the Garden Center and ask for an old school piece of paper we've printed out the entire class schedule on. <laughs> we love handing those out. Of course, Lisa and I camp out here at Waters Garden Center, and we love helping friends, fans of the show. Hi, Ken. The plants of the week in our plumtastic muley grass. Glittering clouds of vivid purple plumes emerge in late summer and persist through the end of the year. It's a natural and showing off all its glory right now at the garden center. A superb hillside plant, especially when situated so that the plumtastic flowers are backlit by the Arizona sunset, all for just $36. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. For people who love plumtastic grass, they love to shop. Hi, Lisa with the finds of the week and our Forester Feathergrass. Dramatic bronze flower spikes start blooming in early summer and don't stop until well into next year. The flowers are so light and airy, it's often referred to as feathergrass. Growing to just hip high, this dainty grass shows off enough to make a designer statement without being invasive. All for under $30. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love really pretty grass, they love to shop. If you want a more fruitful garden, increase success in your landscape that just feels better, then tune in every week to The Mountain Gardener. Years of tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts are guaranteed to make your gardens nicer than ever. Listen to this podcast or read Ken's weekly garden column by visiting watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Thanks for tuning in.